Thank you, Laura. So welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm going to start by giving a very brief introduction to our department and um, the School of Finance and Management, and then I'm going to give the taster session on human resource management. So just to introduce myself, I mean, Laura said um, I'm a senior lecturer, uh, as is my colleague Unsuk, who joins us today. So I'm the undergraduate director, which means I'm sort of in charge of all our undergraduate programs and Unsuk is the convener for the, our BSc management program. And our emails are there uh, in case you want to contact us afterwards or any of our colleagues, we're all listed on our webpage um, on, the, on the SOAS website. Um, so we have two undergraduate degrees. We have a BSc management and we have a BSc accounting and finance. So I assume that you're all dialing in today because you're interested in maybe one of those options. So I'm just gonna briefly talk to, talk to both of those. Um, first of all, just to define what management is, it, it's the study of business, uh, but in the private and public sector uh, organizations. And it's a study uh, that of, of business, but placing it within economic, political and cultural environments. And of course, those are very important at SOAS when we think about regions and our identity, thinking about how culture impacts on business uh, is, is very important. So not just looking at it from a Eurocentric perspective. And that's why um, we offer uh, a distinctive way of, of studying uh, management. So uh, our management programs offer a global perspective, an international perspective, and we, and we discuss you know, real issues facing organizations. So you will get a conventional analysis as you would at any business school or in any management and accounting and finance program uh, anywhere in the UK. But what we offer is a real regional uh, expertise, particularly in the SOAS uh, regions. Uh, so Middle East, uh, Korea, Japan, China in particular, we focus on. Uh, and we, so we have a range of uh, staff and academics who deliver our programs who are all research active and publish in their various fields as well. So what would you study if you joined our BSc management program degree? Uh, this is just an indication of some of the subjects that you might uh, be studying. So you would study the principles of what management is. You would study things like how organizations behave, business strategy, um, accounting and, and analytical techniques, marketing, um, and human resource management maybe, which is the taster session I'm gonna to deliver today because that's one of the uh, optional modules that I teach, which is available for both the accounting and finance and the BSc management degree. You can also, and this is what sets us apart from other uh, colleges, you can flavor your degree with uh, a study of our regions. So you could have a look at some of the contemporary business and economic issues in, for example, East Asia or MENA, for example. So you can choose some modules to flavor your degree with. And if you want to as well, you could choose a SOAS language to study. So there is option to tailor your degree uh, if you want to a little bit more to our, our regional and global identity and add language if you want to. Uh, the BSc Accounting and Finance is a much more um, skilled and tailored professional degree. Um, so it's uh, a profession that sits at the heart of every organization. So whether you're an NGO, a private sector or a huge multinational, you need to take you need to have um, solid operational finances at the core of your organization. And so um, many people will want to, to um, study accounting and finance because it is one of those core professions that every business or organization needs. If you take our BSc Accounting and Finance degree, it will be taught by professionals in the field, and you will also get accreditation uh, with the Chartered Institute of Management Accountant and the um, Association of, uh, I'm trying to think what that <laughs> stands for, but it's Accounting Association as well. Um, so that means you'll get six exemptions from ACCA, the Professional Body for Accounting, and eight exemptions from the SEMA Professional Body if you complete the BSc Accounting and Finance. Um, and just to end this talk about introducing the programs, uh, our entry requirements are there in case you're interested. So the A-level requirement, uh, it, we do sort of ask for maths um, B or grade six at GCSE because of the uh, quantitative elements that are in the degrees, particularly in the accounting and finance degree. Um, so that's just a very quick introduction to our programs. 
I'm going to pause here just before I start talking about the taster session, just in case there's any um, general questions about our department and about those two degree programs that are very, very quickly introduced. Uh, so if there's any questions at this point on, the, on the, the, the degrees themselves before I launch into our taster lecture, I'm um, happy to take those questions now. I can't see the chat, but if Unsuk or Laura notice anyone asking any questions, do let me know. We don't have any questions just yet, um, but perhaps if you do have any questions about the programmes that come into your mind during the taster session, you can also ask those in the Q&A. Absolutely. We, are, we, are, we will have plenty of time for questions at the end, um, and I'm happy to take all questions at the end. I just wanted to pause there in case anything's springing into anyone's mind. But if not, um, I'll just pause for a little bit longer in case someone's typing. If not, I'll carry on in a, in a second to our taster session. Uh, can I just add, uh, in terms of the uh, requirement, entry requirement, uh, those who are taking BTEC, uh, we consider for the DDS, so it's two distinctions in your BTEC, uh, we also consider uh, for mm. offer, offering the place for the student, yeah, for those who are taking the BTEC degree, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Unsuk. I really should add that into my presentation, actually, that BTEC is obviously a, um, a relevant qualification as well. And if you haven't quite met your grades, um, you know, you can go into clearing or you can apply and we can we can look at the whole profile and, and make a decision as well. So if you're worried about maybe not quite meeting uh, those grades, there is the possibility of, of, of still applying. Oh, Helen, there were one question uh, yeah. from the one participant. You can see from the Q&A uh, box. I can't see it because I'm sharing my PowerPoint. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so the question is, what employment okay, uh, employment opportunity does the regional focus offer? Yeah. OK, so um, we've uh, we've had a, students go on to a range of, of employment. You know, some become accountants, some obviously go into uh, uh, study in multinationals. Some go out to if they study the regions, in particular, the language options, some go out to the countries that they're studying. So they go out to Korea, China, Japan, wherever, and they get jobs there. So we've got a lot of ex students and alumni out in the regions, uh, the countries themselves that they offer. And they do a range of jobs, some work for um, local companies, some work for international companies out there and subsidiaries. Um, some, you know, so it's because it's business and accounting and finance, which can operate across all different types of organizations. Um, it's, it's difficult to say that people go into one profession, they go into a, a very wide range of professions. Do you want to add anything to that about? Oh, your... yeah, I want to add, uh, if anybody want to see the real example of, of where our, our graduate are working at the moment, you can uh, type my name in Google and then you can find my LinkedIn uh, uh, the access because of most of my link in, in my LinkedIn is our graduate student. So you can see where they work. You can find the evidence of how they globalize in terms of their workplace, in terms of the industry they work. So many students are graduate working in the major big uh, consulting firms or some already become the entrepreneur and some working in the financial sector. And uh, some, some are doing their PhD and their master degree further. So, so please, please, uh, like the contact my Lincoln or Helen's Lincoln, you can see the, all the examples of our graduate where they're working currently. Yeah, yeah, be, be that's honest. right. I am also LinkedIn with lots of my previous students. And because I'm a Japan specialist, a lot of my um, previous students are out in Tokyo and other places in Japan working. So I keep in touch with them. And when I go out there on research and field work, we often get together. Um, and, and have a meal. So it's really nice to be able to link into them that way. So yeah, check out our LinkedIn websites um, to see who we're, there many of our students are on there. And Helen, there's another question you can see from the yeah, question and answer box. Uh, the student said, uh, uh, you said we need a great fix in the mass in GCSE, but in my offer, you ask for a grade seven. Uh, that student applying to the management degree at BSc Management, is it because I'm an international student? Can you answer on it? 
I don't think so. I thought it was a six, but unless I've got that wrong, I'm I'm sure it was a six that we asked for. It was a, the old the old B, which as I understand it is a six in the new one. Yes, it is a six. Yes, yeah, yeah it should be a six for um, GCSE maths. Um, if you've been asked for a seven, uh, do feel free to contact me and I'll put my email address in the chat box and I can yeah. look into that for you as well. What yeah. is your current uh, current predicted uh, grade, and what is your your GCSE maths, if you don't mind to share with us? Because that that inquiry based on the anonymous attendant. So it, I mean, what you could do is you could when I when I type my email, my email address into the chat box here, you can always just um, message me and and let me know exactly exactly what your predicted grades are, and I can um, look into that. Yeah, admissions. that would be great. And Unsuk, yeah. Unsuk is the admissions tutor for the BSc management, so he can look yeah, at that please, as well. Please, so please do, contact me. Yeah. Yeah. Do get in touch. Yeah. Yeah. With the new criteria of the nine grade in the GCSE, <laughs> it's very, it's always have some great part. Okay. To what extent, whether five or six, what which one is a B? Someone said is a higher C plus or <clears> or lower B. So we are very flexible in terms of the judging. Uh, your GCSC grade, yeah. Great. Foundation in, the, okay. Uh, the student said, okay, I don't have a grade six in math. However, I will be doing the foundation in uh, economy, uh, management, economics and law will uh, passing this insurer. Yeah, place. yeah, okay. that's, that, that can be accepted, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so if you don't have that grade in maths at GCSE level, um, but you're doing your A levels or B tech or foundation year in economics or business or some you know related subject, then we can accept that instead. So as I said, we can be very flexible. We can look at the whole profile. I hope that helps. Any more questions or? Uh, another question is, does the university provide any support with uh, finding a job after graduation. Yep. Um, we have a career service. We have a SOAS career service. And so they offer lots of different events. Um, and so uh, particularly in your final year, it's a good idea to, um, you know, contact the career service. And sometimes they'll be tailored to our department as well. Uh, if we get any job offers uh, from our, you know, job notifications from our alumni, we share them with students, etc. But we have a dedicated SOAS careers service that can help you. It's good to go to their events, particularly in your final year. I want to add up uh, in that answer. Uh, of course, in an institutional level, we have a system to help out for students to find their job. But more important thing is because most of our graduate working very well, in our industry, which means it builds like the reputation of SOAS. So having having degree with a SOAS in your under, undergraduate, it pretty much have a, some guarantee for the potential employer to have a certain level of certainty in terms of the quality of a graduate. So we can guarantee that sort of thing. It's not because we are good, we are good, as well as our students are work hard and then doing very well during their study in the SOAS then it is some sort of the mixture function for the helping from our SOAS institution, as well as expected growing up your, your ability, as well as finally already built in our reputation in the industry sector. So it is a combination of like the working combination, okay, combination when you find a job in the future time, yep. Yeah, and we also have very strong alumni networks um, in the UK, but also abroad as well. So you can tap into those networks, um, whether you're in the UK or abroad. <clears throat> Any other questions more generally at this point in time? Okay, there was some sort of question. Uh, as we are on doing exam this year and not completely sure I am how we're being graded, how flexible would the grade of accept, acceptance be? Because yeah, I so know because of I, the situation of no any uh, the A level. 
cakes. Yeah, um, I mean, we, we fully understand the situation that you're in this year. I mean, I have a daughter myself doing A-levels this year, so it's all going to be assessed. My son as well. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we, we fully understand that it's going to be by coursework assessment and and that you will get a grade of some description. And so, um, you know, that will be the grades that you apply with. But please do apply, as I said, even if you've fallen below what we require, because we, we are aware it's exceptional circumstances and we try to be as flexible as possible and hopefully offer you the degree program that you want to apply for. So, yeah, go ahead and apply to us anyway. Having said that, I think it's, uh, it's very important to address in your personal statement yeah. your clear goal regarding this particular degree, either <clears throat> accounting and uh, finance or management. So it is better to address your clear like the goal, career goal, and then passion, and then keen interest, why you want to study in a particular, why you want to study in SOAS. So it's show, showing that sort of like specific interest and your aim and your goal will be helpful uh, when uh, the examiner assess your application. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Because as I said, we look at the whole profile. Uh, so the personal statement is very important within that. Anything else popping up? Let me check it. Uh... It doesn't look like we have any other questions at the moment, Helen. So, if you okay. Want to, well, we have, we've, we're we're going to have time at the end to take other questions if people think about them as they go along. So, okay, I'm going to um, give a little taster session now on why human resource management matters. Um, I teach human resource management. It's an optional module in the final year of your program. So you can choose it when you are, uh, if you want to um, as, as part of your undergraduate program with us. And to answer the question up front, um, it matters because most organizations, no matter how big or small, of course, still rely on people. People are at the heart of the organization. The uh, human are the main resources of an organization. They give it competitive edge. So even though we are increasingly reliant on technology, and here's a little Honda Asimo robot here right in the middle, uh, we, you know, we haven't moved to the situation yet where we are fully reliant on robotics and techno technology alone. So people really matter. People are still at the heart of any organization, big or small. And so that's why uh, managing them is, is really important as part of um, uh, organizational uh, strategy. So a little definition there, human resource management is the process of hiring, but also developing employees. And crucially, it's about making sure that the way you manage them uh, adds value to the organization. So everybody that works for you should be adding uh, value uh, to your organization. That's how to make it um, strategic. So if you were to take human resource management, what subjects do you think you might study? So if you sign up to my human resource management module, uh, what subjects do you think you might study over that 10 weeks of study? Feel free to type topics into the Q&A chat. Let me just open it. Uh, give me an idea of what you think you might study if you're studying human resource management. What topics might you expect to study? Anything popping up? Can't see anything. I've opened the Q&A. Uh, motivational theories. Some, yeah. Some attendants said uh, equal opportunity in yeah. workplaces. Yeah. Employment low. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. All right. Business so low as well. <laughs> yeah. Great. Leadership, okay. teamwork, yeah. <laughs> HR yeah. strategy. Uh huh. Brilliant. Okay. All right. So here knowledge on it right yeah that's good so here are some of the key um uh things that you would study so uh i'm going to run through each of these i've got a quick slide on all of these just to introduce what they are uh, so these are the kinds of topics you would study and when we study them we think you know what is involved in these functions of hr they're all functions of hr what how can hr managers deliver these as strategy and what are the some of the key challenges and difficulties that you might fo fo you know find 
and what are solutions. So that's how we approach the study of HRM. So I'm going to go through each one really quickly just to introduce the subject. So first, talent management and resourcing. Talent is a real buzz buzzword now and has been for the last uh, 15 to 20 years. So talent, uh, you know, is your employees in terms of their skills, their knowledge, their capabilities. So what you want is high performing talent. That's another buzzword. So you're looking for high performing uh, individuals in, in the market to come into your organization and deliver for you. And then once you um, once you look for them, there's a lot of um, ways that you can try and recruit people. I mean, some of them are really traditional still, job interview, face-to-face -face interview, even if it uses technology these days through Skype, is still one of the main recruitment methods. That face-to-face -face interview before you uh, hire someone is still really, really popular go globally. But there is a lot more uh, reliance on things like social media and even artificial intelligence to help with the recruitment and selection process these days, particularly if it's a large organization recruiting en masse around the world. And then once you have talent, it's about um, developing them as we'll see, but also about keeping them, making sure that you're not losing them to competitors, uh, making sure that you're retaining key people. So retention and turnover strategies is something we look at. Um, and things like succession planning. How do, you, uh, how do you manage talent in terms of movement within your company? And if that's a global company, that's a really complicated uh, part of HR, just keeping track of everybody and making sure they're in the right jobs and moving them around, particularly as they go up career ladders, for example. So that's um, resourcing and talent. Learning and development is a really big um, function of HR. That's, you know, training and developing your employees. Um, many, uh, sometimes it's called HRD, human resource development. So many, particularly big companies, will use a combination of their own internal strategies, but also rely on a lot of external platforms for delivering learning. So it's often described as a learning management system. Uh, some learning will be very formal, you know, sending people on courses, for example, and some will be very informal, such as learning on the job, learning from peers, having coaching and mentoring. So the learning ecosystem is developing a lot now. There are so many ways that you can help your employees learn new skills, upgrade their skills. Uh, so there's a range of, of platforms and activities that you can do. Uh, so some of them have been around for a very long time. Some are much, much newer and rely on technology. So just a range of, of things that you can do, everything from traditional classroom-based learning, sending people on courses to internal coaching and mentoring, but then using technology, perhaps people are signing up for webinars and MOOCs, uh, webinars, what we're running today, for example, to learn uh, something that will help them in their job or maybe help them get promoted. So learning and development is a big part of human resource management delivery as well. Then next we have performance management, and that is, as it says uh, in the name, making sure that your people, your talent are performing well, that, they, that you're encouraging high performance and monitoring high performance. So traditionally, um, many companies will have some kind of cycle where they plan out how they're going to manage and monitor people's performance, usually traditionally in an annual cycle. Uh, so you'll be planning, uh, setting people objectives, uh, managing and monitoring them throughout, having a review session with them, usually an annual review, for example, a face-to-face -face sit down one-to-one -to, -one to see how they're getting on in their job, see if they're meeting targets, for example, and then think about whether they'd, if they're doing well, whether they get some kind of reward, uh, and then start the cycle again. So we look at the various techniques in performance management. For example, we look at 360 degrees, uh, feedback and appraisal, where you get lots of different people feeding into any one of our own uh, performance reviews. We look at how you can set key performance indicators and targets and goals, measurements for people uh, to strive for in their job. Uh, and we even look at how performance management is sort of increasingly influenced by other areas such as sport, for example. So high performance sport techniques can be used in, in business now too, in terms of encouraging performance. And then we look at changes. So uh, traditionally you would have a one-to-one -one annual review in many companies, that's still the case, but more, more often than not, many companies are, uh, are moving to a system of more fluid, regular, flexible performance management. So we can be monitored through technology and iPads, for example, uh, every day in our jobs. So there's an example here of uh, Hans has done a presentation and he's asking for feedback. 
his colleagues or his clients can feed in and say, well, this is how we think you did today, Hans. And, and the organization can collect this kind of data uh, as we'll see when we look at HR analytics. So we, for every um, element of HR that we look at, we're very conscious that technology is helping us with our management of people more and more these days. Reward management, very crucial. Many of us don't want to work for free. We want some kind of reward or pay for doing so. Uh, so reward is very subject to how people perform, but also subject to how the business is doing. Uh, so if the, if the business is not making profit, it's unlikely to be able to deliver some of that reward back to employees. So reward management it can be a very complex operation in terms of decision. This is a real life example from a company uh, when they're thinking about what they're, how they're going to uh, when they're reviewing their pay, they have to think about what how the business is doing, what kind of um, budget they have, and also measure the market. So they measure the market, look at what competitors are paying, make sure they're paying competitive rates. Maybe in any given year, they might be able to pay slightly above the competitive rate if they really want to attract top talent. But reward is not just about pay and financial benefits. So sometimes it can be other types of reward. It could be the offer of doing training paid by the company could be extra responsibility and promotion. It can be recognition in terms of uh, prizes, for example. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you can reward and motivate people as well. So it's an interesting uh, field to look at. Then we have employee relations and engagement. So this is, uh, both of these really try to manage that employer employee relationship that we have. Employee relations is quite the formal uh, relationship. So it looks at everything. And some people put this into the chat. It looks at employment law and legislation. It looks at how you're supposed to deal with people formally within the law. So how you hire them, how you discipline them, how you might make redundancies, for example, um, how you might have to negotiate with unions. Employee relations is very specific to um, to countries so be because it's very determined by employment legislation and employment law can differ from country to country so we really have to be aware of that when we study employee relations what the law says in the uk may be very different to what the law says in china or in the middle east countries for example so it's very country specific employee engagement some people mentioned motivational theories already so things like motivation trust have been around for a long time Employee engagement tries to bring all of that together now. It's um, how do you, uh, employee engagement is how do you have engaged, focused, passionate employees that are motivated, have loyalty, are committed, um, So how, and how do you communicate with them? So it's sort of a higher level um, motivational theory that we look at. It's about how you manage people effectively to make sure they're highly engaged and tuned into the company and delivering for you. Uh, so that's a field that takes on a lot of those um, theoretical issues of motivation and trust that have been around for some time. Then we have diversity management, which students really love studying. In fact, most of them end up ans ans answering the essay and exam question on this for some reason, because they, they like the subject. So I'm sure you're aware what diversity is. Um, again, it's prescribed by law. So in this is the UK um, Quality Act of 2010 which protects all of us in the UK uh, if with under these nine characteristics listed here in the workplace. So we cannot be discriminated against in the workplace for having one or more of these particular characteristics. But diversity is much more than that. So uh, there are some uh, legally protected characteristics, but there are lots of different things that make us different and unique. Every one of us is different and unique because of all our different um, uh, uh, background, uh, education, and our and our and our ethnicity, etc. So, the big buzzword now is diversity and inclusion. How do you make sure that you embrace everybody's uh, uniqueness? How do you capitalize that in terms of being a creative and inclusive organization? So, we study things like uh, race and ethnicity. We study gender, and we look at how multiple, you know, different generations, age, diversity in the workplace can be quite a challenge to manage in organizations as well. So students really like uh, that uh, study of uh, diversity management, which is an increasingly important part of human resource management now, uh, particularly as we, we live in more multicultural countries, but also as, of course, global multinationals that go around um, employing lots of different people around the world as well. 
HR analytics is the quantitative side of HR. So it's about understanding how to measure HR, how to measure performance, for example, um, how to collect data relating to HR statistic uh, to people. Some of the things we do are really hard to measure. Motivation is hard to measure, for example, but other things are easier to measure. So absenteeism, for example, is easy to measure. Um, so some of what we what we deliver is is quantifiable. Some it's not, but it's really about collecting information on people and their performance and feeding it back into the organization, feeding it back to individuals and teams, but feeding it back into the understanding of talent management as well. So this is an example from Deloitte. Deloitte takes a lot of information from their employees, uh, feeds it into their systems, calls it big data um, analytics for the and then and then uh, produces what they call the Netflix of learning, their learning and development ecosystem that they produce in terms of training opportunities is really crunched through from what, uh, how people are delivering already and what they need in their organization. So analytics and robotics and technology is a big part of, of um, measuring HR now and, and thinking of new ways to deliver HR functions like performance and learning and development, for example. And then finally, strategic HRM is how to make sure that HR is not just an administrative back office function. It's a real business partner to the organization. It's a function that really drives the organization forward. And so this gets to the point of what we we're saying, you know, why does HR matter? Uh, HR is a field that's growing in importance. It's growing because business is increasingly complex. Uh, global competition, new technologies, diverse workforces, as we've seen. So there's lots more complexity to work. At the moment, we're in a really complex situation for work, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. We're in a pandemic and we're in lots of different new modes of working. Today, we're delivering this online to you. Normally, you would come into the SMS campus and we would chat face to face. So we're all working in, in lots of different complex situations. So keeping abreast of that and, and responding to that is really important. Employees are more demanding and, and rightly so. We want work-life balance. We want flexible working. We want career progression. We want individual career programs. We don't want to necessarily work for the same organization for our entire life like maybe our grandparents did. So employees are more demanding and organizations have to sit up and take notice to that. Uh, so HR is a much more complicated field. HR itself has to demonstrate to the organization that it can add value, that it knows what it's measuring, it can deliver results, and it can deliver high performing talent for the organization. And it's increasingly expensive. So recruiting good talent is expensive. Uh, heeding employment legislation is, is an increasing cost. So overall, HR has to be strategic, has to know what it's doing, and it has to be accountable to the business like any other function in the organization. So it's really moved away from traditionally being seen as just an administrative back office function that just hires and fires to a much more strategic value adding function that sits in the organization alongside other other um, departments like finance, sales, production, etc. It's just as strategic. So it's about getting the balance right, making sure that you have uh, HR tailored to the business objectives, but also that you're satisfying individual needs as well. So if you think of the stone here as the business and these are the people, you don't want it weighted in one direction. You want it to have more of a balance. Uh, and that's really complicated to deliver, um, but it's about getting the function and the image and the strategy of HR right within the organization. And then finally, just talking about COVID, for example, and I'm just adding this slide in, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion now about how work is changing because of the pandemic. Uh, we're in a really unique, complex situation. Businesses are having to respond to that and HR are having to respond as well. So this is a graph from a company called Gartner who's done a lot of work on this. So they're saying there's lots of new trends going on. Some have been around for a while. So data collection on HR and talent and, and remote work has been around for some time now, but we've seen a massive spike in it, of course. Remote work, working from home, uh, that is something that's just gone incredibly through the roof. It's been around for some time, bubbling in many economies, but of course now it's just increased uh, exponentially. The employer as a safety net is, is much more important. So things like well-being, employee well-being and support 
again, have been around for some time, but many organizations have to really intensively invest in that now because as we are in a crisis situation and as we're uh, not in the workplace together, we may need different types of support and community. And then, you know, the government's playing a role in that as well in many countries in terms of helping companies with furlough and things like that. So it's accelerated a lot of trends relating to work and HR. Also, it's meant that companies have to be really critical about how they evaluate what's needed. So what are the, in a, in a crisis situation, how is your business going to change? Are you forced to stop your business and furlough workers? Are you forced to do something different, particularly if you're in a, a frontline key worker business of, a, of any kind? So it's about thinking what are the critical skills and roles that you need in a crisis? Who can deliver? Maybe you need to move people around in the organization to deliver them. And a lot of talk about humanizing work, workers and dehuman. So who are the top tier employers? who's treating their workers really well in, in the during the COVID pandemic and who's not. So I think what we'll see is we'll see a lot of uh, top tier employers uh, emerge out of this, those who really handled and cared about their workers and their HR during the pandemic. And so going forward, we'll see uh, a lot of, there's a lot of talk about resilience, recognizing fragility in your organization, recognizing where there's gaps in your talent, for example, how to redesign your organization and business to be resilient, to be flexible, to be adaptive, to learn from crisis. So we're in a real complex situation at the moment and HR has to play a key role in that within the business. So it's it's quite, it's, it's not fun necessarily to be in a pandemic, but it offers organizations a lot of lessons uh, in how they cope with um, you know, their business as a whole, but also how they cope with their, their employees and talent. So to sum up, um, if you came and studied HR or with us, you would, you know, these, uh, these types of uh, areas that I've looked at and very briefly introduced, you would study them with us in the same way that they would be studied at any institution that offered an HR module. But what makes us distinctive as well is that we will think about these HR functions, not just as, a, as, as alone as a, as a business HR function, but within society, culture, history. And so we look at our regions as well. So we, we have, uh, when I teach this, I have several sessions looking at HR in other countries as well. So we look at HR in Korea, Japan, China, Middle East, and we say, well, how is people management and HR different over there? How is it developed differently? Uh, to what extent is it a hybrid mix of sort of best practice, you know, Western based HR or what, to what extent is it Chinese style HR, for example, or is it a hybrid? How is Japanese HR um, uh, progressed over the years? How is it different when Japanese companies go abroad? So we look at it from a very regional perspective as well. We have a lens into those, those um, countries. And so we don't just consider HR from that Western UK, USA historical perspective, which is often the case in many institutions that teach HR. We take it beyond that and think about how global HR is distinctive in many different locales. So I'm going to leave it there. Hopefully you've had an idea of, of what HR is um, and maybe you've even thought that would be fun to uh, study if you came. So I'm going to stop it here, stop sharing my slide and we still have time, I think, for any questions. Um, it doesn't have to be on HR, it can be on anything you like, uh, but we have some, some time left for Q&A. Uh, Helen, there's a one question from the Q&A box you can see now. Okay. So is there unique things to include in the personal statement? Yeah, I guess, um, so apologies that our finance and accounting convener couldn't be here today. Uh, and so can I are involved on the management program rather than the accounting and finance. But I guess it would just be you when you're applying for any degree or program, you know, why are you particularly interested in that subject? So as I said, accounting and finance is a very focused professional technical subject and so it'd be good to say what why you why you're interested in that subject in particular maybe your career aspirations maybe something that has inspired you to take it because of something you've learned at school or a part-time job that you've had uh, anything you can add to flavor so it doesn't so that your personal statement doesn't read as a generic statement but is really tailored to the subject that you're applying for uh can i add in that way for example 
like the sum of a statement saying that, well, oh, I do the school orchestra, I, I do this uh, sports activity, and then I do this activity, this activity, then finish. It is a, one of the typical stereotypes of a poor statement. Uh, when you apply any particular degree, regardless, it could be finance and accounting. Yep, I would like to say that any sort of your uh, experience, your activity, you try to link with your applied okay, degree. But to what extent your activity, your study is related to your applied it, the degree. And then to what extent it helps for your future career if I take that degree. So it's showing your logical plan in your career, also try to link what you have done so far. So try to best your effort to link your experience into the your applied study and then appeal, yes, I need that study in order to further develop my goal and my dream. So it would be, yeah. this is a perfect types of the statement I would like to suggest, yeah. There's a question there about BBC. I mean, I think if you get BBC and you really want to come to SOAS, go into clearing and, and, and then see, see what happens. I, I mean, I can't say for sure that you will get in uh, if it's significantly lower, but I wouldn't say don't apl not apply. I mean, I would come into the clearing system. Would you agree? On so yes, I agree. Yeah, it is, it is a, a bit difficult to say formally now because yeah. but that marks is given by your teacher is not by your official examination which yeah. means it's very difficult to judge however as helen said you you still have opportunity and then we might consider yep and remember that you get ucas you get an overall ucas points and that's based on other things as well whether you've done other 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 things like Duke of Edinburgh Award or have you know music uh, so there's lots of, there's lots of other ways to get UCAS points too um, if in September COVID and we have yeah so I mean we're hoping to go back to campus in September obviously and have face-to-face have -face lectures again we're still going to decide how that might work that will depend where we are in the pandemic we might have um, a more hybrid situation where we record at the same time we don't know yet but we always put all our even before the pandemic we always put all our slides and lecture slides up on, into our intranet system uh, anyway. So um, we'll, yeah, we're gonna work out what, what, what will happen. So there may be a hybrid situation that occurs, but I think if we go back to face-to-face, -to -face, it's good to get um, people back into the classroom. Grade five in GCSE maths and businesses. Yeah, if you've got businesses A-levels, that's great, yeah. We can, we can consider that even if the mass grade is slightly lower. As I said, if you've got business or economics or something relevant in A-levels or BTEC alongside maths, even if your mass is a little bit lower, we can consider that. Um, and yeah, if you've got just one grade that's lower, still apply because we can, as I said, we can take the whole profile into consideration. And if you've just missed in one area, uh, we can, um, we can look at the whole profile. For the case of the uh, uh, Salina, okay, I don't know whether my pronunciation is right. Uh, what is your expected predicted mark for uh, A-level business at the moment? So while she while she maybe replies to that question, um, someone asked, "Will there be a freshers' week or is it cancelled?" So this uh, last September we had a freshers' week, but it was more online. So we still had it, but it wasn't as face to face. Obviously, in September, we hope that we're getting back to face to face freshers week. Um, but we still we still had one this year, but it was um, distanced. <laughs> so it's not quite the same, but we still had it. So it still gives you the ability to meet people, go and, and, and join clubs, etc. But they probably didn't run in the same way as they do in a normal year. But hopefully we'll be back to normal. I was um, going to ask Eleonora what your experience was of your freshers week. Oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. She said she's got a B right now. So a B is good for um, economic, is it economics, did she say? Uh, so, uh, business. Business, yeah, yeah. So we are overall requirement is an ABB, right? So, yeah. so <coughs> a, a business is B, and then if you can manage with others as A and B, yeah, we, mm. we highly likely consider, yeah, for that case, yeah. And then other That's... question is, do we need a, a level mass for the finance? 
No. So you don't need A-level maths. We want GCSE maths. But if you're doing economics and business for A-levels, which it seems that you are, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, and as the, as the freshest week, I've been at Soas for the past three years. So <laughs> I've had the chance to attend both the physical and the virtual freshers week because it's not only dedicated to fresher. Every cohort of students can, can actually go to uh, the freshers week. So the virtual one last year looked like Helen said. So we had virtual meetings uh, for all these societies involved in the student union. And we used Microsoft Teams to attend all these meetings. And but I really hope you I really hope that you guys will have the chance to actually attend the physical one and that the <coughs> pandemic uh, won't be a thing anymore in September. So in that case, uh, it will be hosted physically at SOAS um, in the main building and in the other so buildings know. that SOAS um, is made of. So yeah, um, it's, it's a great chance to get to know all the other societies and fellow students as well. Because if you join a society, you're likely to meet people that share your same interests because they will join the same society. So it's a great opportunity, whether it is physical or virtual. Thanks, Eleonora. That's really helpful. Thank you. Helen, have you responded to the uh, Marian's uh, the quest? I think so. Yeah, uh, I said, yeah. Yeah, yeah, said, yeah, yeah. Economics business is highly relevant, so no problem at all. Yeah. yeah. Someone said they got an offer for AAB and they're not sure what they're going to get. But yeah, as I said, if you do get slightly lower grades, please still do apply because we will consider, we know it's exceptional circumstances. We will look at the whole profile. We look at the grades. So even if they're slightly below, yeah, we will still look at um, your applications. So please do apply. If you don't have face-to-face -face lectures, how do you meet other students? So um, for lectures, you tend to be in a large group like you are today, but for tutorial, you will have tutorial classes for every module where you go into much smaller groups. So there might be 10 students or 15 students in a tutorial group and you all put your cameras on and you, and you meet each other that way. Also, our students have been setting up WhatsApp groups and, and other um, Zoom groups to, to um, you know study together etc so there are options of course but of course we hope that we'll be going back to online face-to-face -face lectures and, and meetings and if um, i may jump in right there a yeah great please do to, yeah a great chance to meet other students is to actually move into student accommodations yeah so the so yeah. only student accommodation that will be done with the house where you can meet a lot of other so students mostly freshers as well so that's a great chance in case um, so was is forced to host only virtual lectures, then moving into accommodation would be a great chance. Yeah, that's right. And um, then I have a question about any any plan for a webinar for international students. Maybe Laura can answer on yeah. that question. Yeah, sure. So throughout the year, we have a, a range of webinars and, and we'll let's, let inquirers and students know about them uh, and applicants that are looking to attend those sorts of webinars throughout the year. Um, last year, particularly for international students, we had um, orientation sessions. So we had um, sort of uh, pre-departure sessions for international students coming from overseas. Um, and then we also had um, sessions to um, help students orientate themselves once they arrived. So again, they, this year they were offered online, um, but, but next year, hopefully, um, they will be back to being offered in person. But obviously, if we have to run them online again, we would do that. And Helen, maybe you can answer on that question in terms of our optional module to what extent yeah. is over it with economics. Yeah. Yeah. So if you, you can look at the detailed program structures year by year on our website, but you'll see that sometimes in um, some, some, some of the modules that you have to take are, are compulsory. And then you get every year you get to choose from an options list. And so sometimes there'll be some economics courses in the options list. Sometimes there'll be our courses. Maybe there'll even be courses from another department if it's a regional focus, for example. So you can choose from a range of options. And so sometimes there is overlap with other departments in the sense that you have the ability to choose some modules to flavor and tailor your degree from outside our department as well, even though the, the, the core of your degree will be our, our modules, obviously, from our department. And then in a chatting uh, room, we have a question. Can studying in accounting and finance allow someone to work in a bank or a similar organization? And then what is the ratio of the independent learning and the learning from the lecture? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, so accounting and finance is, is necessary for every organization, as we said. So you can go into a bank particularly, or you can go into any other organization as, as a, in that accounting and finance func function. So, yeah, but particularly important if you want to go into the banking sector, then yeah, definitely. Um, what was the other? What's the cutoff date for offers to be sent? Do you know, Laura? Yeah, so um, it will depend on when you when you made your application, but generally speaking, for students who've applied by the 29th of January deadline, um, the deadline for universities it, as a whole in the UK to get back to you, it will be the 20th of May. In terms of our sort of um, turnaround time, uh, it's around about three, two to three weeks. Um, so you should hear back within that sort of time scale. Um, don't yeah. don't panic too much if you don't hear back dead on that time scale. Um, it, it may be that we've got a lot of applications to get through at that particular time. So it might just be taking slightly longer to process them at that point. Um, but generally speaking, the time scale that we try and get back to students is two to three weeks. And that might differ depending on the universities that you've applied to as well. Um, everyone has their own their own time scale that they work to. Yeah. So and there's a one uh, one question about, OK, uh, does the SOAS help students teach them how to work with the programs like the Excel? Yeah, it is an important okay, issue, like the studying uh, business and management or studying finance and, and accounting. For those who are applying for the finance or accounting degree, of course, uh, is a combination between sort of okay, learning the theory and then having the mindset of the being a good leader in that particular industry, not just as a machine. Of course, it's very important to learn uh, to knowing the knowledge about the using the analytical tool. So it's not just Excel in, in university level, if, especially if you join for the SOAS, our management degree, as well as accounting and finance, you are going to have opportunity to learn key methodological analytical skill. So you are going to have a chance to use the particular software, statistic analytical software to apply to the rear uh, analysis of the financial statement or their uh, annual report or the key situation or accounting statement. So you're going to have a chance to learn to uh, learn to the particular quantitative, okay, uh, analytical software, not just Excel, for example, we are going to use SPSS or uh, MVVOs, like the such qualitative and quantitative computer basis analytical tool, you are going to learn about it. It's not just for the uh, finance and accounting degree, it is also for uh, BSc management degree as well. So as yeah. you can see from our website, you can have a, uh, the module for the financial analysis or quantitative analysis and then key uh, like the methodological course you can find it. Yep. Yeah. Someone asked about ABB. Yeah. So our offers are AAB or ABB. So yeah, ABB is good. Um, can you become a CFO with an accounting and finance degree? You can certainly build your way up to being a CFO if you start out with an accounting and finance degree. That's a very good start. So yeah, I hope I hope you do become a CFO one day. <laughs> CFOs definitely need accounting and finance skills. And I think we we hasn't uh, answer on the ratio of the independent learning and the learning from the lectures. Yeah, uh, so Eleonora kindly answered about 50-50 there as a student perspective. Yeah, do you want to add anything on so? Uh, in terms of the uh, the lecture hours, like the key structure for uh, so so as our lecture hours is two hours of lecture. It is sort of. Uh, one hour, two hours lecture delivered by the lecturer, and then one hour for uh, tutorial session we call it is it is run and then organized by the student so discuss the key issue you learn from the previous lecture and then you have opportunity to discuss together using the case studies or typical financial statement so it's a small group of the discussion so basically you can say we can say that uh, the lecture and the tutorial are something around two hours to three hours per per module per week then in order to prepare that three hours lecture and tutorial, you need to have a spend, I would like to say around six to the 10 hours of the readings and the preparation, uh, discuss with your colleagues and then classmates together. So it is more, I wanna say, a lot of independent study also involved in the university level and then which makes you more happy because you lead your study, not by force by the teacher. 
Okay, yeah, we are, and you can we are study together here, with yeah. friends as well. We have lots of, when we're on campus, there's lots of little places around the campus where you can get together with friends and study together as well, informally as well as formally in tutorial groups. Yeah. How much do you earn on average after doing an accounting and finance degree? <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. I, I don't know. CFOs earn a lot, but you'd have to build your way up to that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. What do you think? And so average financial accountant, what do oh. they earn? More than an academic, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so is it depends on what is the definition of work experience. For getting offer from SOAS, you don't need to have any work experience because you just need to have a passion, okay? Mm. Clear career goal. Of course, when you start your, your degree with the finance and accounting and SOAS, uh, I can give you some example. A lot of our students apply for the internship during their summer vacation or winter vacation, or during the term period, they work as a part-time uh, you know, accounting firm or the banks, yep. And then try to build uh, their CV to be uh, the end of their final goal as a real accountant and then finance analysis. So you can you can share that kinds of the information with your friends and then also our career department also provide opportunity for the internship as well. So it is sort of you you have to actively to find opportunity uh, during the like the vacation time for your internship in related industry. Yeah, this is my comment on it. Yeah. So, how is the how are the degrees assessed? Well, basically, you have to get a certain you have to um, do a certain number of modules overall to get the degree, and the modules are all assessed broadly similarly. So, you will have coursework and assignments or essays or quantitative uh, coursework, which may count for about thirty percent, for example, or forty percent of your module, and the other sixty to seventy percent will be uh, an exam. Uh, so that's usually how most of the modules are assessed, that combination of coursework and exam. And then each module builds up to the overall um, degree uh, at the end. And then you will come out with a, a first or a 2-1 or a 2-2 or a third degree. So that's, that's typical UK assessment. Uh, there's a combination of exams and essays. It depends on the subject. So if it's accounting and finance, it might be more quantitative based exam. Uh, if it's human resource management, it's essay based exam, for example. So it depends how qualitative or quantitative the module is in terms of content. So it's a combination of essays and, and more um, uh, numerical tasks for accounting and finance. Um, I think we've answered. Yeah, so grade five in GCSE maths, but, but also doing economics and stuff is good. I think we answered that one, yeah. I know we're up to four o'clock now, Laura. Do we want to? Um... Yeah, it's probably time for us to start wrapping up here, but thank you very much to everyone for joining us. And thank you, Helen and Unzip as well. And thank you, Eleanor, for being here too. Um, if you do have any further questions, do feel free to contact us. So you can contact us at study at soas.ac.uk with any general questions you have. And I'm sure um, both Helen and Sook would be happy to answer any inquiries from you about the programmes as well. Um, so do feel free to get in touch with them. Yeah, oh, I, can, I can answer on the final question regarding the math. Yes, uh, if, if you are not good in the math, we are struggling in the exam. Uh, yeah, a certain exam you are going to be struggle. However, we can't. We, we don't need to say in that sort of thing now because you are not. You 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 will not know what you are going to be in a in a time in the exam. So, we are we also provide the module for the business math. Uh, so it means uh, those who, who are entering our module, although they are not, uh, they didn't take the A level. They have an opportunity to improve your math required level for. Uh, for the capture on the learning, uh, uh, the capture the required the learning requirement. So don't worry about it. Once you become the SOAS student, everybody, based on my experience, they catch up the required math level. So yeah. don't worry about what is your current math level. More important thing is your passion. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a very good answer. We do have the business maths option, and also, you know, even if it's been a while since you've taken maths, you will you you can catch up. 
Um, well, thanks everybody for coming along today. Do contact Unsuk or myself if you've got further questions. Our webs you can Google us on the SIAS website or Laura uh, can be contacted as well, study at soas.ac.uk. I hope you enjoyed the session and I hope we see some of you at SOAS in September. <laughs>